Hi, I'm very pleased to be speaking today with Rob Blair, who is an assistant professor of political science at Brown University. My name is Gardner Campbell. I've been working with Open Learning 17 and Open Learning 18, and I've also had my uh, interests in the area of network learning for many, many years. So I was very excited to read about uh, Rob Blair's network course on uh, democracy erosion. It's the democratic hyphen erosion.com domain. I have lots of questions. I'm eager to get to them. But first of all, thank you very much, Rob, for being here today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So I read about your course in uh, the newspaper. I believe it was the Times. The Washington uh, Post. Yep. It was the Washington Post. Okay. And as I read about it, of course, I was fascinated by the topic and also quite fascinated by the design of the course itself in terms of the network. So let me uh, just start off by saying for folks who don't know about the course, if you could give a description of the course for us and also uh, tell us something about why you chose this networked collaborative approach to bringing in partner schools. Sure, uh, so, so the basic idea of the course is uh, it's, it's a course on why democracies fall apart. Um, and we, we approach that question really from an empirical perspective. Uh, so what do we know from uh, theory, from history, from social science uh, about the, the causes and the consequences of, of democratic erosion? Uh, and we use the term erosion uh, very consciously because that's typically the way that democracies fall apart today. They don't, they don't typically fall apart in uh, in coups or in other sorts of large scale, sudden uh, events of, of collapse, they, they tend to decay uh, quite a bit more slowly. So um, basically the, that, that's, the, that's the sort of broad theme of the course. And we've structured it so that it's, an, it's a multi-university collaboration. So we have, uh, I believe it's 20 universities now participating, uh, 19 in the US, um, one uh, the University of the Philippines participating as well. Um, we share a syllabus, so basically a group of us got together over uh, the summer before the 2018-19 academic year uh, and put together a syllabus that we would share across all versions of the course. Uh, and we have uh, various aspects of the course that are collaborative among the universities. So for example, um, rather than writing uh, conventional papers, students write for a blog, which is shared across all the universities uh, basically, they, they um, take some recent or current event uh, in the news, in the U.S. or elsewhere, and then they use the readings from the course uh, as a lens through which to understand uh, that event. And then they're, they're required to comment on one another's posts, and, and oftentimes posts are actually explicitly responses to uh, previous posts. So, for example, uh, at, at Brown, we had a couple of students uh, who debated whether uh, the fake news mantra is a threat to democracy in the U.S. And one of them argued essentially that it's not, uh, and the other one responded that yes, indeed it is. Uh, so that, that's one component of the, of the collaboration. Uh, another is, uh, in lieu of a final paper, all of the undergraduates uh, write country case studies. So they basically take a, a, a case that has, a country that has experienced some democratic erosion over the past uh, six or seven years, and they write a case study and the format of the case study is standardized. Uh, and the reason we do that is because master students at Texas A&M are then taking all of those case studies and turning them into a meta-analysis uh, on the, the causes and, and symptoms of democratic erosion that will be presented to USAID's uh, Democracy, Human Rights and Governance section uh, in May. So they're actually just getting to work on the meta-analysis right now. Um, so at, at Texas A&M, it's being taught at the master's level uh, in the Bush School of, of Public Policy. Uh, for them, you know, their, their final projects always involve some external client where, where they produce some policy relevant deliverable. It just so happened that their client this year was USAID, so this really fit nicely with, uh, with the theme of the course. Uh, and then finally, in most versions of the course, um, students are required to attend some political event uh, in the area around their university, and then they write a blog post reflecting on that event. So it could be a uh, a rally in favor of uh, of immigration rights, right, like the, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, uh, or it could be a pro-Trump rally or an anti-Trump rally or a town hall meeting or any number of different events. So that's, that's basically the structure of the course. Um, and uh, to answer the actual question you asked me, um, the reason we decided to do it this way, uh, it was for a number of reasons. So there, there were sort of logistical reasons where 
I, I knew I wanted to teach this course. And as I started talking about it to other faculty, there was a lot of interest from them as well. Uh, and so it became clear that, you know, well, if we're, if we're all interested in doing this, um, why don't we, why don't we join forces, uh, exploit some economies of scale so that, uh, we can share the lesson planning, uh, share, uh, the, the syllabus design and, and other sorts of things that otherwise each of us would be doing, uh, totally on our own. There was a more, you know, a sort of deeper reason for doing it, which was that I, I at least, uh, certainly felt very surprised and, and confused by the result of the 2016 election in the US. Uh, a lot of the other faculty felt that way as well. Um, and, and really just as, as a, from an empirical perspective, it, it wasn't what we expected. Uh, and I think we, we also felt that the, the tone of the campaign had really created a lot of, a lot of alienation among uh, not just us, but among our students as well. Um, and, that, and that's across the political spectrum. I mean, that was sort of a recurring theme of, of, of the election was the alienation that, that people felt. And so we really wanted our students to feel that they were part of a conversation that was, that was bigger than just a, a standalone seminar or a standalone lecture. Uh, so to connect them with, with students at, at other universities around the country, uh, and, and our goal really was to get as so some intellectual diversity into this conversation as well. So uh, Brown is a very left-leaning university. I'm sure that won't surprise anybody to hear. Um, a number of our other participating universities are, are very left-leaning as well. Um, but we also have some in, in, in more right-leaning states, Texas A&M being, being one example. Um, Georgia State is participating. Uh, Ohio State, these, these are places that you don't typically think of as sort of bastions of uh, liberalism. So the hope was we could have um, not, not just uh, you know, diversity of students across the country, but actually diversity of, of perspectives as well. Um, and I think really in, in that respect, the course has been, has been a great success. I think students really do feel that they're doing something more than just uh, sitting in a, in a classroom the way that they always do, that they're, that they're contributing to a broader conversation, um, not just you know, putting their writing up there on the blog for, for anybody to read, uh, but also communicating their ideas directly to, to a policymaker to USAID, uh, and having this networked conversation across all of these different campuses. So you've got various ways in which the network assembles itself. You've got various ways in which the network's uh, output, if we call it that, uh, feeds into different kinds of opportunities. There's some marvelous recursion going on. It's a really interesting and thoughtful design that also seems to me to have taken advantage of some serendipity. Um, is, is that fair? <laughs> definitely, definitely. So let me ask you a little more about the way the network has operated. And as, as I say, part of this reflects my own fascination with opportunities for network learning that I think uh, are largely untapped in higher education, but are implicit in some of the structures, at least to now, that we still have available to us. Uh, across the internet or on the web. I mean, the very fact that there is a website, democratic-erosion.com, reflects a number of barriers that could be there but are not in yeah. terms of identifying a locus for this kind of study. So uh, let's start back at the beginning. You mentioned conversations with uh, fellow faculty at other schools. How did those conversations take place? Were they primarily face-to-face -face at a conference? Were they mediated primarily by email? Uh, how did that happen, and how did you get that network of conversations um, activated and focused enough to be able to come together? So it, it actually started with a, with a lunch with a couple of my colleagues here at Brown, um, where this was shortly after the election, um, and there has been a, a lot of rhetoric out there about how U.S. democracy is under threat, how Donald Trump in particular poses a threat, and, and I think we felt just very ill-equipped to, um, to really understand whether that was true, and, and if it is true, what we should be doing about it, and if it's not true, why we're also worried that it is true. Uh, and so really, we were just talking over lunch about, you know, what, what could we do from our position as academics to, to try to shed some light on that, not just for ourselves, but, but for our students as well. Uh, and the idea of the course arose over the course of that of, of that lunch, and then we basically, uh, my colleague Jeff Colgan here at Brown, uh, the two of us just started putting out some feelers, just emailing some friends uh, to see if this was of any interest to them. Um, it really was sort of a snowballing process where, uh, you know, so I, I study, dem democratic erosion is not my um, wheelhouse, typically, that's not what I study. I study uh, international intervention and the rule of law in Africa. Uh, 
And so I reached out to other Africanists, uh, people who study intervention, uh, because they're just the people in my network to see if they were interested in this. And as we started to get more people, it started to seem like, you know, actually there's, there's quite a lot of interest in this. Uh, so we ended up writing a blog post uh, for the Duck of Minerva, which is a, uh, an international relations blog that, that a lot of folks in political science and, and IR read. Uh, and from that, we got some additional takers. Um, I ended up uh, basically just circulating uh, a sort of form email to a, to a bunch of different networks that, that I'm connected with um, in political science uh, and got some more folks uh, interested that way. Uh, and then a lot of it turned out to be word of mouth. So I ended up getting emails from people who just heard about the course um, from, from, you know, in one way or another uh, and were interested in, in signing on. Uh, and then, of course, you know, with the, um, so the Washington Post wrote this really nice piece about, about the course uh, a, a couple of weeks ago. And I've gotten a bunch more emails now uh, from universities that, that want to participate next year. Uh, so it's sort of a, a combination of face-to-face of -face mechanisms and, and uh networks, our immediate networks, and then also just these broader networks that we reached out to. So it's interesting that the word immediate in this case means uh, two things, at least I hear two things. One of them is uh, proximity in terms of expertise or uh, groups Correct. that were already there, but also immediate in the sense that I can't imagine forming and uh, actualizing this kind of conversation or the course that resulted via snail mail. I mean, yeah. it's, it's striking to me to uh, having lived through a lot of this transformation myself to hear that, well, email, you know, of course, email, it, 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 but that's a global light speed telecommunications network right. that like the web riding on the Internet as it does permits certain kinds of very rapid affinity group uh, formation, which you were able to uh, capitalize on. And then this blog. I know the owl of Minerva flies at midnight. Is, 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 that, a, is that a play? The duck. I, you know, I should I should know what what uh, duck of Minerva actually refers to. I don't know. Um, uh, it's just you know, it's one of those uh, one of those blogs that we're all kind of keyed into. anybody who, anybody who studies IR in any in any way kind of knows about it and, and checks in with it every now. So and then. so so who sponsors that blog? Do you know anything about where it comes from? Is it just one of the things like it's like air now? It's just there. Or? Uh, for us, it's like air uh, for for people in IR. Um, I so it's it's run by a, a group of of editors. Um, and, and they basically, they have some folks who, who post really regularly, uh, and then they, they have invited contributions or, um, you know, people, people basically uh, submit contributions for them to publish uh, as well. So it's, it's a combination of those things. Uh, and we have a number of these venues in, in political science at this point. So with those models out there in front of you, were you informed by that? Did you have that in your head when you decided? And when did you decide to purchase the domain democratic-erosion.com? How did you decide that this course would have a domain? Well, I think uh, that, that really became clear once, it, once we realized that it was going to be more than just a small handful of universities doing this. At, at first, it, it seemed like maybe it'll just be two or three of us uh, we'll try this as a dry run, and then if others are interested in joining later, we'll we'll expand. Uh, but pretty quickly, the number got up to you know ten, eleven, twelve, and, and we got to over a dozen. It was clear, you know, we need some mechanism uh, to to coordinate our activities and and to allow students to really engage with one another um, virtually. Uh, and so, so the 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 website was an obvious way to do that. It was also a way to to project this out to the public. So we wanted this to be something of a public good. So the syllabus is up there. You know, you can you can get. There's links to all the papers. Some of them, unfortunately, are paywalled, uh, but but many of them are not. Um, and they're you know they're books you can buy. There are articles you can read on the web. Uh, so we wanted to really invite this, invite people to come in and, and experience this as a as a as an outward looking uh, project as well. Uh, and that, so, so the website has existed for, for quite a while, I and mean, we have, you know, we've had great um, tech assistance here at Brown to keep the thing up and running. I'm not a, I'm not a tech guy myself, so it's been very helpful um, having folks who really know what they're doing with this. So people at Brown did help you with website design. Did they buy the domain? Does that belong to you? How, how, how are those little pieces work? These are very logistical questions, but part of my, my um, 
agenda here, I guess, is that if somebody wanted to do this about, I don't know, anything, right? like what, what were the steps, the little pieces that you had to pull together to be able to do that? So basically, so uh, we, we ended up getting some financial support um, from the Swear Center here at Brown, which is, uh, it's, a, it's a center that, that tries to merge uh, scholarship with, with uh, public engagement and, and, and you know, civic action. Uh, and so this, I, I basically pitched this to them, uh, explained to them kind of, hey, you know, here's what, here's what we're trying to do. Uh, they have some, some grants, some small grants that they offer faculty to develop courses uh, that have this sort of engaged component to them. Uh, so I met with them and, and we started talking about the course uh, and I got a, a grant from them to, to, that I used to, to hire a research assistant and a teaching assistant who helped me get this thing off the ground and then also to buy the domain um, to, to get a tech RA uh, who a tech research assistant who basically helps us who's, who's still on our payroll and, and just makes sure the, the, the everything's up and running and nothing is crashing on us uh, so that was you know that financial support was was very important I should say you know it's not terribly expensive to, to set up a website like this you know it's a WordPress website we did buy the domain but you know we didn't we didn't break the bank um, we didn't break the bank doing it uh, really I used most of that grant uh, to hire uh, research assistants here at Brown who could help us read some of the vast literature that's out there and, and kind of figure out what, what's going to go on the syllabus, what's not, uh, and then to help with some of the coordination across universities. Do you have a background as a blogger yourself? Have you done much outward facing uh, work in, in your history? No, I, uh, when I, I saw I, a lot of my work has been in, uh, in West Africa, especially in Liberia. And when I first started working there, I, you know, I wrote some pieces for the Huffington Post. This was back in I don't know, 2009, probably. Uh, and then hadn't really done much uh, after that. Uh, wrote something for another of our political science blogs. Uh, this would have been, you know, maybe a year, year and a half ago. But hadn't, hadn't really done a whole lot of outwardly facing uh, writing. But it was always something I was interested in. I knew that I, not, 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 you know, becoming a public intellectual necessarily, although that, that certainly is appealing uh, as well, but just wanting to get ideas out there beyond the, the rather narrow um, community that I, that I occupy. Uh, so it was definitely, it was on my radar, even though it wasn't something that I was doing very often. So that leads me to another thing I'm very curious about, which is, of course, the cross-university student blogging. Uh, I myself have used student blogging for many, many years and have always found it to be extraordinarily helpful, though there are always objections, uh, not so much from the students, but from people who I think, you know, understandably uh, are concerned with issues of privacy. Maybe the word or the acronym FERPA has been tossed around a little bit in your presence. Uh, these are kind of typical responses. Uh, I find the student blogs and the way you've set it up uh, just, you know, extraordinarily refreshing and wonderful. We're following along not just with resources provided by experts, but we're also following along with fellow learners, and we're all part of that group in one way or another. So could you talk a little bit about how you decided for the students, first of all, to be networking their learning via blogs, and second, for those blogs to be out in the open and visible and how you framed that as an activity for the students as well. Yeah, so this, this actually was a bit delicate um, because we really, we, we wanted the students to have a platform where they could put their ideas out there, um, but we didn't want to subject them to any abuse. Uh, so you'll notice if you go on the website that only students can comment on one another's posts. We don't allow uh, the public to comment. And that was basically because we thought, you know, we've read, you know, internet, comment <laughs> boards before we know how sour these can turn uh, and we just thought you know these are our students these are these are undergraduates we're not trying to be overprotective but at the same time we don't want to subject them to to sniping from some anonymous commenter uh, that, that happens to read one of their posts and, and objects to something in it so we we try to walk that that thin line we have had students who are who are concerned about privacy uh, and so we have a couple of students who are who've posted anonymously or under pseudonyms uh, we've allowed that. Um, we we don't we don't encourage it. We like this to be something where students really feel this is this is an argument that I am am comfortable enough making that I'm going to put my name uh, name behind it. And you know, in in general, these are not tangentious pieces for the most part. It's it's the students really trying to understand what's going on in the world uh, through through the readings that that we assign them in class. Um, but but 
it, it was definitely, we, we had a lot of discussion about um, whether this was an appropriate mechanism, uh, how we could make sure that the students would feel comfortable posting. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's been sort of a mixed bag. I, I, I think in some respects, um, you know, so I've used uh, Twitter and other platforms to sort of blast out um, post as they arise. At this point, the posts are so many that, that I don't do that anymore. It was really when we were just getting started. Uh, but now we have, you know, hundreds of students writing for us. Uh, so there's just a lot of content up there, too much for me to keep up with. Uh, although that's something we will, we're thinking of other ways to deal with that in the future. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, we, 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 we wanted this to feel, we wanted the students to feel like their ideas really were getting projected out there. Uh, but we did want to put in some safeguards. So I think the best way to have the students feel like their, their work is being engaged with is to allow comments. You know, let, let anybody come on the blog and, and comment, and then the students can see, you know, this is the number of people that actually commented on, on my post. And that's a real good immediate metric of, of uh, you know, how much attention the, the piece is getting. And we just thought there, the trade-off, you know, on balance, it just made sense not, not to allow that. Um, but in general, I think the students have actually found it to be a useful exercise. Uh, and we're thinking now of ways that we can actually um, spread their ideas even more widely. So for example, um, a number of posts from the fall 2017 semester have been assigned as required readings for the spring 2018 students. So we create some continuity that way. Um, where, and so our students from the fall, they know, you know, now my ideas are required reading for students at, you know, over a dozen universities across the country uh, and students that are taking the class this semester, they get a chance to read models uh, of, of really, you know, especially uh, good and especially topical blog posts that they can then use uh, as inspiration for their own work. Uh, we've now teamed up this actually, we just finalized this this week. Uh, the Social Science Research Council has a great project called uh, Anxieties of Democracy. Uh, and part of that project is a um, democracy papers series. Uh, where they invite uh, some pretty big name political scientists and, and other social scientists to, to write on some topic related to democracy uh, on for, for their it's it's more than a blog really it's it's essays uh, but big names including names that we read actually in the course uh, and so SSRC agreed to have a contest where our students uh, they will they will publish uh, probably two to four of, of the best posts from our students from all the universities that are participating so far. So we'll basically, each of, our, each of the faculty will nominate one or two posts that, that were especially good, uh, and then we'll send that long list to SSRC. They will decide who the winners are, uh, and then they'll work with the winners to expand and polish the pieces and put them up. Uh, and those pieces will be published alongside some of the top thinkers in the field. Uh, so that's another way we're trying to get get students' work out there. Um, we also had a contest where uh, we teamed up with Bright Line Watch, which is a group that is running a survey of uh, experts and the public, uh, basically gauging perceptions of US democracy over time. Uh, so we had our, and their data is all publicly available. So um, we had some tutorials where we had their in-house data scientists uh, speak to some of our students about how to play with the data, how to make sense of it, uh, and then our students have been using the data to actually write blog posts, and our hope is uh, that eventually we'll set up a contest with Brightline Watch as well, where the best post that uses Brightline Watch data will then be uh, you know, showcased on, on their website too. One of the interesting parts about the student blogging, as I can see it happening, is that they're blogging, but posting their bloggings to the democraticerosion.com site. Right. Did you did you give any thought to having the students post within their own blog sites with a domain of their own or with some uh, blogging platform, let's say a WordPress friendly or WordPress blogging platform on their own and feeding that into the site uh, via RSS? What what was your thinking as you thought about uh, those two things? It just the reason I, I asked for a couple of reasons, but one is. If they're blogging on their own, they can, of course, moderate their own comments in, in ways right. they choose, which right. is, if you're going to be out in public on a blog site, it's probably a, a useful uh, skill. But yeah. uh, I'm just curious about the way you thought about that as you, as you put the design of the course together. Yeah. Uh, so to be totally honest with you, I hadn't even thought about that as an option. Uh, but I, now that you mentioned, I think it's potentially a good idea. Um, we were really uh, just trying to set it up in a way that would be as simple as possible for, for the, the immediate 
uh, purpose of getting this thing up and running. So this is the first year of the collaboration. We really didn't know how this was gonna go. Uh, and so I had used WordPress before. Um, my research and teaching assistant had used WordPress before and had some experience with it. And so we just decided, you know, the, the easiest way to do this is to set up one of these posts, uh, one of these sites, and then have the students basically, uh, you know, each of them gets their own username, uh, they can they can sign up so they can they post themselves they can you know see what's happening with their their post they can go back and edit if they want uh, we hadn't considered giving each student their own domain I I think my worry if we did that was would be that uh, that would just open up a lot of technical potential technical problems so every student would have to figure out how to do that uh, and in some cases you know UCLA for example. Uh, they uh, they incorporated parts of our syllabus into a, an introductory lecture class on comparative politics where they have you know 125 students. So having 125 students setting up their own domains, um, you know, probably more than a few of them would would end up with some technical difficulties along the way. Uh, so that would be my my hesitation. Uh, but it but I think it's potentially a, a good model. Well, it does add a layer of complexity. There's no doubt of that. Uh, one way around it is to have a WordPress multi-site installation, where essentially what you use is one central domain in which everyone has their own subdomain, yeah. and essentially setting up their own blog instance, but not an instance of WordPress itself. I see. Uh, and then they get the, the opportunity to choose themes, come up with their own headers, uh, essentially personalize the site so that it's uh, reflective of of who they are as learners. But yeah, it's another layer of complexity. And another reason I ask this is that um, it is fairly unusual in my experience to see a site devoted to a course in this way that also seems pretty savvy about things like WordPress and RSS feeds. There's even a way to get an RSS feed of the posts. And Right. You know, one of the things that uh, has kind of been in the air since Google Reader died is that people don't even know what RSS is anymore. And if, right. if my students are any example, um, they're also forgetting what a URL is. And so there's a way in which uh, the very affordance of the web that could empower more uh, distributed and kind of democratically interesting conversations uh, seems to be eroding as well. So uh, your course is contributing to the... Um, a conservation of the web uh, in some ways that are interesting to me. Do, do you talk about that at all? Do you talk about the web and the internet? There you are in the medium that also, uh, you know, the Russians hack into and uh, has brought us, uh, you know, all the dismay of social media. Do, does that topic of the web itself ever come up? Uh, I don't know if the topic of the web per se, certainly the topic of uh, infiltration of the web and, and, uh, you know what what's going on now with Russian interference and and uh, and fake news and and these other themes that that certainly arises all the time uh, or at least certainly in, in my class uh, we talked about that quite a bit. Um, you know the RSS piece that was really I continue to use an RSS reader and so I just thought well I want to be able to follow the blog uh, so, so let's make sure I'm able to do that um, and uh, I don't know how many other people subscribe to it but. Uh, uh, we, we could probably find that out. I hope it's, uh, you know, I hope it's more than a few. Um, I, I do think this certainly has, has, it has sparked conversations with individual students about uh, issues like internet privacy, issues like, uh, you know, some of these are students who are, who are graduating and want to go get jobs and, and uh, what happens if they post something uh, controversial. Uh, do they want to then, you know, do they want to take that down after they, after they finish the course? What do they want to do with that? Um, which aren't, it's not quite the conversation I think you, you, were, you were referring to, but it's, it's certainly thinking about um, the role that the web plays in their lives uh, now as part of the course and then also moving forward, how, how that they will, you know, there will still be a footprint of the work that they did uh, in the course when they move forward. And, that, and that's quite different from a usual course where, you know, you write your final paper, you submit it to the professor, the professor gives you grade, and that's it. Uh, and so this, this is a different exercise in that way. David Wiley has a phrase uh, for the kinds of assignments that students do just to get them over with and really have no life, except perhaps at the bottom of a birdcage uh, or mulching uh, after the course is over. He calls them disposable assignments. And in some respects, what's happening here is the very opposite of that, uh, to the point that people do have to start thinking about their digital footprint. Uh, and yet, it's also the case that what's being put out here, at least from what I can see, are 
ideas formed in the process of learning. So they're not as if this is the position I take for the ages and must be evaluated in that sense. They really are an account of the way people's minds are engaged with questions over time in a way that's not like an op-ed or not like a position paper that you have to defend when you run for municipal, uh, you know, sheriff or whatever. Um, How do you describe that interesting permanence and provisionality, the way in which when you talk to the students, this does go out there, it can get quoted, it may get quoted, that could be a good thing or a bad thing, but it's also an account of you as a learner, and that too is a valuable part of the public discourse. How do you articulate that for the students? Yeah, well, I mean, so in terms of the way I articulate that for the students, really, we just we just tell them from the outset, you should think of these as, as living documents. Uh, it's not like a final paper in that you submit it to me and, and that's the end. Uh, it still lives there and you can go back and, and revise. If you change your mind about one of the ideas that you published, uh, you can go back and, and revise or you can write another post responding to your own post. Uh, and and so, you know, think of this as an opportunity for you to um, to, to go through this sort of iterative process of, of understanding a, a complex topic uh, and knowing that you're not putting out the, the final word. Uh, I don't know how many students have taken the opportunity to go back and, and revise their post. I know a, a handful have. Um, it probably doesn't happen all that often. They've got a lot of things <laughs> to do, um, a lot of other work to get done. Um, but I, I think they appreciate that aspect of it. Uh, certainly, you know, I think there are some posts, so some of the students write about topics, right? I think the, they have a pretty strong position and probably a pretty uncontroversial position. You know, if they write about what's happening right now in Poland, for example, um, there are very clear signs of democratic erosion in Poland. I don't think anybody would really argue that there aren't. Uh, and so some of those posts, I think, are, it's just a chance for them to sort of um, verbalize what, what they've been learning. Some of them are, are quite a bit more complicated. Uh, you know, we've had, we've had interesting posts about cases like Japan or Germany, uh, places where it's not so obvious what's going on. And, they, and there, I think the students really are using this as a venue to, to just air some ideas, right? To kind of put them, put them out there uh, and, and see how other students respond to them and then, and then hopefully uh, continue revisiting them as the semester goes along. My, my hope is uh, that because these stay out there, uh, they're, they're still out there on the web, that even if students aren't going back and actively revising their posts, they're keeping them in the back of their mind in a way that they might not if it were a paper that they just submitted for a seminar. So, you know, my hope is the student who wrote about, um, you know, the rise of far right parties in Germany. My hope is he's still thinking about that now. He's still reading about what's going on in the news. Uh, the student who wrote about uh, the, the lack of populist parties in Japan. My hope is that he's still, you know, following what's going on there and, uh, and, and has his, his earlier argument in the back of his mind, even if he doesn't go back and, and, and actually revise it, he's still revising it in his head. Uh, and that's exactly the sort of iterative, iterative process that we want to encourage. So you have that most laudable of pedagogical ambitions. You'd like the learning to become part of the fabric of their yeah, ongoing right, right. intellectual yeah. life. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lofty goal. Well, uh, I, I don't know how, how often it is realized. But. but, you know, it's certainly the odds improve if this public venue that is linkable, searchable, uh, out there in this global lightspeed telecommunications network is the platform than if it's on, uh, you know, nice 20 uh, pound uh, printer paper, uh, 12 point uh, one inch margins, which then, you know, it's a, as uh, JCR Licklider once said, a piece of paper is a great display technology, but that doesn't make it a great information technology. Uh, it, it's it, because you can't get at it. It's right there. Speaking of that, uh, another question about uh, the way the web itself is an implicit agent or actor in this course. Do you talk to students about hyperlinking? Do you encourage them to link out to things or to link to each other? To what extent is that something that um, you talk about in the course? Yeah, so we definitely, we very explicitly encourage them to hyperlink. uh, And and part of that is as is citing, you know, so if these were standard papers, we would have them, there would be a list of references uh, at the end of the paper. And these aren't standard papers, but we do want them to be doing research. We want them to be able to defend 
uh, the claims that they're making. And hyperlinking is sort of a, it is a, short, a shorthand sort of referencing. Uh, it's an alternative to a list of references at the end of a, a standard academic paper. Uh, so all of them, not all posts have hyperlinks, but, but the vast majority of them do, uh, and we do actively encourage that. Um, we also, we explicitly encourage them to write posts in response to one another, uh, and obviously when they do that, to, to hyperlink. Um, we thought about actually requiring that they write at least one of their posts in response to another student. We didn't end up uh, including that requirement this semester, but it's something that I think we'll revisit after the semester's over, all of us will, will get back together and we'll think about sort of what went well, what, what we could improve. Uh, and that's one thing that, that we've already flagged as a possibility for the future to just, uh, you know, the students right now, a lot of the, to the extent that they're engaging with one another, some of that engagement is voluntary. Uh, if you want to write a post in response to somebody else's, you may, but you don't have to. Uh, you do have to comment, that, that much is a requirement. Uh, but in the future, you know, we might add a little bit more prodding to, to, to ensure that there's even more uh, communication across universities. Prodding, scaffolding, encouragement, it's all part of that. Exactly. It's that developmental ethos that encourages people to have a broader view of what they might want to want, uh, yeah. which, which, is, which is mighty meta, but um, it brings me to the, the final question I have for you. It's the final question for this particular conversation. I have about 50 other questions. But, um, <laughs> So what is the future for this course? Uh, what, what are the things that have surprised you? What are the things that have most pleased you? Or uh, maybe you think, gee, that could certainly be built out. Uh, yeah. Is this something that you plan to continue? Because of course, as Neil Young observed, Rust never sleeps and democracy right. itself is uh, extraordinarily prone to erosion uh, because of its own lofty ambitions. So what's What's the future look like for democraticerosion.com? So we are going to certainly continue the collaboration next year. Um, and we, I, I suspect most of the universities that are teaching it this year will teach it again. And we've already got a handful of additional universities, probably six or seven, maybe more, that are lined up to join the collaboration. And hopefully more will do that, uh, including some universities, some more universities outside the U.S. So we've got um, Bengarian University in Israel uh, is looking to join. Uh, Science Po in Paris is looking to join. Uh, we've been in conversation with some folks in Germany, some folks in London, um, seeing if we can get more transatlantic uh, collaborators. Uh, so we're hoping to make this really more of a global course as, as much as we can. Um, so that, that's one aspect of it that's gonna, that we're going to uh, expand. We are going to have a conference uh, in August, late August, uh, where we're going to invite uh, a group of probably around 30 students to come to Brown, uh, along with a bunch of the participating faculty. So they'll get to actually see each other face to face. Uh, this has been a purely digital form of, of communication and collaboration so far, and we want to add some, some flesh and bones uh, to, that, to that as well. Uh, so they'll basically come to Brown for a day. Uh, we've raised a bunch of money to, to host the conference and we'll pay their way, we'll pay their lodging. Uh, they'll have, there'll be a series of, of lectures and, and small group uh, projects and some breakout sessions and hopefully a keynote and some meals that we'll all share together. Uh, so that'll be, um, that'll be a nice way to just get them to, you know, to get to really interact with one another face to face. Um, two aspects of the course that I was maybe disappointed is too strong, but, but things that I think we could improve. Um, so one is, I think there are more opportunities to, to create uh, digital, opportunities to create sort of digital ways for, for these students to communicate beyond just the blog. So uh, University of Memphis taught the course in the fall uh, when I was teaching it, and we had a joint virtual session where we used Zoom uh, to, to have our students communicate with one another. Uh, around the posts that they wrote about the, the political events. So we really, you know, Memphis is obviously a very different setting than, than Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, and we were just interested in, in having the students talk to one another about their quite disparate experiences attending some of these political events. And it was, it was very promising. We had some technical difficulties that, uh, that hopefully we can overcome in the future. And I'd like to see that, I'd like to see a lot more of that. Um, I'd like to see students interacting, not just on the blog, but actually face-to-face, -face, even via, via the internet, but, but still face-to-face. -face. Um, or maybe having you know, discussion boards 
that are more informal than the blog, but where uh, maybe they're specific to particular readings where we post some questions and we ask the students to jot down, you know, four or five sentences in response to, to those questions and then they can interact with one another. Uh, we would love to create a purely online version of the course. So right now uh, you can go to the syllabus and you can download the readings and you can, you can follow along. Um, we will eventually post lectures uh, and discussion questions for each week of the syllabus as well. But what we'd really like to do is create a version where no matter where you are, no matter who you are, you can log on and you can hear the lectures uh, being delivered by the actual faculty. Uh, you can participate in discussions uh, with, with other people who are, who are logged on with you, uh, maybe a Coursera version of the course or an edX version of the course. Um, we thought about that a little bit for this year, but even just keeping the wheels on this thing was complicated enough without adding uh, that additional layer of complexity. But that's certainly something we're looking at, um, if not for next year, then certainly uh, moving forward. Uh, and the other thing is, e even though we have um, a fair amount of intellectual diversity among the students, ultimately, uh, universities tend to be more left-leaning than their, their respective states tend to be. And students who enroll in this class, they, they tend to enroll because they think, you know, maybe, maybe something's amiss with American democracy. Uh, or the you know, democracy in, in whatever their, their home country happens to be. So we'd like to more actively encourage students to take positions uh, that might not be their own personal views, uh, but, but to, to get outside of their comfort zone a little bit, their political, you know, partisan comfort zone. Um, on, the, on the syllabus, we try to have competing perspectives on, on any particular issue. So if we're going to have a post, you know, assign them to read something that's very critical of the Trump administration, for example, uh, we'll have them read something else that, that's, that's pra that praises the administration on, on, for, for, similar, for similar reasons. Uh, and I'd like the students to, to engage with that a little bit more, uh, to, to try to get outside their that sort of standard political bubble that a lot of them occupy. Uh, and I don't know exactly how we'll do that, but it's something we're going to be thinking about moving forward. Well, one of the things that drew me uh, to the course you're teaching and made me say, I've got to get in touch with this person and, and do an interview, uh, was actually a learner testimonial that was quoted in the Washington Post article about the benefits of communal learning and being able to see the various perspectives in various locations. And that's great, but the greater part, at least as far as I'm concerned, is that I could go and, and read that student's work. Right. Right. I wouldn't necessarily be able to do that uh, in a Coursera course or an edX course, certainly not in a Blackboard course or in a typical learning management system. Right. And while there was and always will be a kind of vulnerability in being able to be quoted in that way, um, it also means that if people can see you and they're people in, you know, who are well-meaning and uh, certainly I hope to believe that I act in good faith, <laughs> you can make this kind of contact and yeah. not, to, not to get mawkish about it, but that was a moment of hope for me that morning as I read that story. Hope for the web, hope for higher education, and the kind of hope you always get when students go, whoa, <laughs> this is really working for me. And the, this is not a conclusion, it's the experience of learning with others. So is that something that you've noted as well? And is it something that your colleagues have, have, have talked about? Absolutely. I mean, I think that is a major part of the appeal of the course for the students is knowing they're going to be networked in this way. Uh, they're, they're not just communicating with an audience of one or an audience of, of 12 or however many people are, are sitting around the table. You know, they're really communicating much more broadly than that. Um, I'm really excited to teach the course again because when I taught it, there were just three universities teaching the full syllabus and there were a few more that were teaching, uh, you know, four or five weeks from the, from the syllabus. So it was really, it was sort of the, the first, my students were really guinea pigs uh, for, for this project. This semester, you know, there are 17 universities. Uh, that are that are participating. So it's just exploded in a in a in a big way, and, and it'll continue to do that. So uh, I think that you know the more networked the students feel, I think I think it just, it, it really does. It, it's it's an intangible benefit of the course, but a, but probably the most powerful one that they really feel like they are part of a conversation that's happening outside of the walls of their classroom. They really are communicating uh, with, with people all across the country and, and all across the world. Uh, and that, I think, is a, is a major draw. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to do whatever we can to continue building on that. Uh, I think it's, that's really the, the, the heart of the course is, is, 
encouraging that sort of networked communication. Well, this stuff doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't happen easily. It doesn't happen without good leadership. So if I can salute you and your colleagues for the work you're doing, <laughs> which is uh, bold work. It's often difficult work. It's not always uh, recognized by the home institution, but it sounds like you've got some support for that. Um, and, and it's also the kind of work that you, you don't know what will happen until you're in the midst of it. So in that sense, it's kind of doubly bold and will never be less than bold as long as you're committed to a public layer of this. But uh, I, uh, as I say, it was a moment of hope and it's been a real honor and a privilege to be in conversation with you about uh, this, uh, this grand and ongoing experiment. Uh, long may you run and thank you and <laughs> all your colleagues uh, for, for, for the work you're doing. Well, likewise, I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak about it. It's been a great project so far, and, and I, I love knowing that it's generating interest. Uh, it's, that's really terrific for, for me as well. So thank you very much for the invitation.